Good morning. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. <laughs> Hi, this is Jamie. Sorry. Oh, I can hear you now. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I just had us on mute because we were just getting set up here. But yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was working. I yeah. <laughs> um, and my husband probably told you about our situation. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. you weren't feeling so good. Yeah, and then you know the kids were kind of yeah. It was, <laughs> it was easier for me to be at home today. Okay, great. All right, and can you see us all good? Is that a good angle that I got it at? Yes, I can see everything, and I, I'll turn on my camera when I can. But for now, it's easier if I'm, I'm kind of multitasking here. So, but yeah, on yeah. your end, I can see. Um, I can see everything. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Jamie. I'll leave you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Close the meeting. So yeah. just there, just to end for all. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll put this to you know, round up the heart <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> only he can hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll Rector whistle, like a dog whistle. Let's <laughs> uh, see if there's a, anything in here that gives the. Oh, uh, history. No. That's good. This is a subject of. This is good for me to come to the team because it takes so long. Yeah, you tend to forget a few things along the way. Huh? You tend to forget a few things along the yeah. way. Yeah. That's <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Cameron not get on yet? It doesn't appear so. Was this Cameron going to be zooming today? Yeah, he was a, a exposed to COVID, so he's oh, for the safety of all of us staying home. So, um, let's see if I'll text him to see if he's joining. Us. He may be having computer trouble. Jamie's here on Zoom. Hi, Jamie on Zoom. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, did I click the? Um. Well, we can get started without Karen. All right. Well, have a, uh, let's, let's open with a word of prayer. I'll introduce Jay, and um, it's us and the rights today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of learning and growing in the knowledge and love of you and of your son by the power of your Holy Spirit. For the inspiration that comes through that knowledge and experience of you, the encounters holy and new that drive us out into the world in service and back to the body to connect and deeply bond with one another and with you. Thank you for what has drawn the visitors and newcomers to St. John's in this season and for this opportunity to stretch our minds and to learn a little more about our tradition, about our history, and about you. Bless Jay as our speaker and each of us who listens and learns, that we may be so edified and so uh, challenged and inspired that we may leave this place renewed. In your name we pray. Amen. Jay, Amen. Take it away. Yeah. I'm wondering if uh, 
we couldn't get a little bit closer to each other. That, yeah, I mean, not 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 in the sense of uh, uh, you guys could come up. I, I wouldn't feel so strange being way up here. Absolutely, uh, that, that would help out. There's coffee there. There's hot water. Uh, there's some snacks. There's there's Cameron. Uh, so uh, greetings. Uh, I've been I've been given the task of talking about history. Uh, in Anglican history in particular, and something which I uh, particularly enjoy. So I'm really glad to have the opportunity to do this because it's really interesting history and um, a lot of twists and turns and complications, but um, something I think that will help us all, you know, establish ourselves in our understanding of our, our broader traditions and faith. Uh, there's actually some... Uh, uh, props up another uh, got it. pot there, so I think we're, we're, I think we're okay. Coffee. Right. Sorry, Jamie and Cameron, we've got fresh coffee here. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I've got my Italian coffee right here. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I had to show myself, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing over there? Um, every once in a while, you may hear some coughing, so I have it on mute. Okay. okay. All right. Good. <laughs> um, and Micah says she's running late, but should be there um, hopefully soon. She said to start without her, but she'll be joining. Okay. Christianity in Britain uh, came in with the Romans, as far as we know. Uh, and during those early centuries, uh, the connection between Rome and uh, uh, and the particularly what we now know as England and Scotland, or not Scotland, so much, mostly England, was relatively close. And we know, for example, that when um, the pirates uh, grabbed uh, St. Patrick and took him to Ireland, that his father had, was a deacon. So he was a part of that Roman tradition. And it's probable, although we don't know this for sure, that St. Patrick himself uh, went to Rome for some training, or perhaps uh, Southern France uh, for his own kind of training. We we know less about St. Patrick than a lot of people think we do. Uh, nothing about driving the rats or anything else out of It's true. But anyway, we know that Patrick had been a part of that Roman tradition when he began the church in Ireland. And that's part of the broader story and an important part of the broader story of Christianity in Britain. But after the Romans left uh, and after a series of invasions from the continent of, of uh, various pagan tribes and so forth, um, Christianity in Britain was, was not eliminated, but it was certainly diminished. Uh, and that diminishment uh, lasted for uh, some decades. Uh, but at the same time, while, while Christianity in Britain was diminishing because of the, the, you know, the, the Romans leaving and the pagans coming in, um, Christianity in Ireland was actually flourishing. And this becomes part of the story of the reintroduction of Christianity into Great Britain. Uh, because the Irish, the early Celtic Christianity uh, was in some ways uh, different than Roman Christianity on the continent. Um, whereas uh, in the continent, there were cities with bishops and cathedrals. The Celts weren't like that. Ireland had no cities. Uh, it, it was, uh, you know, the Vikings that brought cities to Ireland, not uh, the Irish themselves. So what was important in Ireland was not the city and the cathedral and the bishop, but it was uh, the community uh, of, around an abbot uh, and monks and nuns, the abbot and the abbess. Those were the real powers in, uh, in Celtic Christianity. And the bishops that were part of the Irish tradition were there to do things that bishops have to do, like uh, to do confirmations and that kind of thing. But it was really the abbots that had the power. And the other thing that was characteristic of Celtic Christianity was that Ireland became famous for its learning. Those great monastic foundations became centers of learning. People from all over Europe, uh, perhaps ironically, came uh, to Ireland to be trained in the faith and in a lot of other things as well. And then Irish uh, uh, teachers went to Europe as well. 
So you had this tradition of learning in Ireland uh, that was attractive to people on the continent as well as people obviously from around uh, the Irish Isles as well. The other thing about the Irish is that they were missional in their orientation. Uh, they went into Scotland and, and they were missionaries to the Picts. They went into Northern Ireland, I mean, into Northern uh, uh, England and uh, were evangelizing up in the Northern regions around uh, York and, and so forth, all the way over to the Holy Island of Lindisfarne. And these, these uh, uh, set off from the little island of Iona. The Holy Island of Iona was a, a missional center, uh, sending missionaries all over Northern England and then eventually onto the continent as well. Some of the great monastic foundations in Europe, even in Italy, were founded by Irish monks. Um, and so this movement of Celtic Christianity had its impact, particularly in the north of England. Now, you know, the, the Celtic Christians have been um, um, a, a lot of uh, things have been said about them. They've been romanticized, but these were fierce old aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, these were not warm and fuzzy people, but they did have this terrific love of learning. And there's a really wonderful story told about them. One of my favorite parts of reading some of the stories of the old Irish saints is that some of the miracles uh, that they did were uh, about the preservation of books. Mm -hmm. So if you dropped your book in the water, then the saint would bring it out and would dry it off, you know, and you dropped it in the fire to restore. They had such a love of books uh, that, you know, they had all these miracles that were associated with learning. And then also there was um, uh, this love of nature and creation. Uh, they, they talked about three different martyrdoms. The red martyrdom, which was to be uh, killed for your faith. Uh, the green martyrdom, which was to go out into nature uh, and, to, and to live as an ascetic on one's own. And then the white martyrdom, which was to go on uh, mission work wherever the wind blew you, in some cases quite literally. So you had this ascetic, learned, kind of wild, decentralized form of Christianity that was formed in the north of England. Uh, and then in 597, uh, Pope Gregory uh, sent uh, a man by the name of Augustine. This is not the great North African bishop. This is a different Augustine. Uh, this one is known as, a bishop, as Augustine of Canterbury. And this great, uh, Pope, uh, Pope Gregory the Great sends him to kind of re-evangelize and re-establish uh, the presence of, the, of Christianity in the southern part of England and uh, intent, as it turned out. And so Augustine comes, he forms a monastic community, he begins evangelizing, and his evangelization is successful. Uh, uh, the king of that area is converted, and, you know, the, the more Roman form of the faith begins to expand north into England. Now, the, the form of Christianity that was brought um, by Augustine was more centralized, it was more organized, it was more disciplined, it was more authoritarian, and it was more connected with cities and towns, uh, and bishops were much more important than abbots and abbesses. So what happens? Well, there are differences in culture and differences in practices between the Celtic church in the North and in Ireland and the Roman church in the South. Now, all of this is important because I think both of these traditions enter into Christianity in Britain and form to some extent who we are to this very day. There were, the differences were such that they had a, um, a synod in, in the town of Whitby in Northern England and in this synod, they had to make some decisions. One of the big problems was the calendars were different. So the, the king, in this case, Oswy, is um, trained in the Celtic tradition. And his wife is a, a, a princess from the continent, and she's in the Roman tradition. They have different calendars. 
she's in the middle of Lent and he's celebrating Easter. <laughs> well, it didn't work very well. And then there was another thing which may seem ludicrous to us, but it was a, a, a sign, a symbol of something else. The monastics on the continent in the Roman tradition tonsured their hair in a circle. They cut the hair on the top of the head. You know, you see this to this day. Mm -hmm. The Irish cut the hair off from the front. So, you know, it was hanging down the back and it was bald in the front. Um, and that was an argument of what was the proper way to, to cut your hair. Seems like an important ditch to die in. It's an important <laughs> ditch to die on. Well, it's you know, it's a meal, so. right. <laughs> Right. what's it about what's that about it's about authority really you know it's not about haircuts it's about who gets to tell you how to cut your hair uh now the the issue of the date of easter i mean that that was actually a, a serious issue but the other one was the question of who's in charge and so they have this synod and the roman representatives uh, perhaps predictably prevail. And uh, the Celtic representatives head back to Iona, and that tradition went on for generations. It wasn't wiped out, and, and in some senses was never entirely wiped out. But the, the, the learning and the focus on the monastic tradition, uh, the, the whole independence, uh, all of that worked its way into the Anglican tradition, into the Church of England tradition. So the Celts are still hiding in there, in spite of the fact that in 664 at the Synod of Whitby, they kind of lost their, their power. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Jared, do you have a question? Uh, I was going to uh underneath some of the Celtic spirituality too, and maybe you're, you're moving in this direction, but it felt like uh, there was also that inherent indigenous spirituality that predated Christian arrival, which is sort of like, like all over the globe, right? Where Christianity goes, there's this wrestling between the authority of the outside, you know, religion or institution and the prevailing spirituality of a people. And Celtic Christianity predates Christianity. Like there's a, yeah. there, you can find it in those stone circles and things that there's something else there that they were not tabula rasa when Christianity arrived. Yeah. And that's also a part of it. Absolutely. And, and in fact, as you say, the Celtic Christianity of, of, of Ireland was in some ways an indigenous Christianity that had risen uh, not without total contact from Rome or the continent, but with very little mm -hmm. over a couple of centuries because of the collapse, collapse of Rome. Mm -hmm. So the traditions that they had developed were unique to them. Did you have a well, been so like it, it really we're talking about sort of two different types of syncretism. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean both syncretic, but they both sort of had a different evolution, a different origin. Right. In a way, so the arc of both of them is a little different than they sort of come into some conflict. Yeah. Right? But every I mean every every encounter of you know local religiosity with sort of you know what about indigenous sort of religiosity is syncretic, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you, so it's really interesting to see how these encounter in different ways. Fascinating stuff. Islam has a lot of interesting stories about this too, actually. So anyway. well, I mean, if you think about Ireland, I said there are no cities, and they have these communities around hill forts. And so what what does Irish Christianity begin to look like? It begins to look like a community formed around the hill fort, except at this point, it's a bishop in a monastic community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a, a, a a terrific element of, of indigenous spirituality. And what do they do when they want to build uh, places to pray? They don't put up standing stone, but they put up a cross, an elaborately carved mm -hmm. cross where people would gather to pray. And you go to the island of Iowa today, and they have some crosses that date from the eighth and the ninth century. You know, so uh, everything else there is from. Uh, is more recent, it's from the 13th century. But, but those are, you know, as you were saying, part of that indigenous spirituality of, of the Celts and, and the attachment to nature and creation is also part of that. Um, but as I say, we shouldn't 
to romanticize them. Uh, um, they had this notion that standing in freezing water with your arms stretched out and chanting the Psalms all morning was a way to spiritual growth, <laughs> which is <laughs> made a, a, a way to pneumonia, but I... They sound like vaguely Minnesotan in a way. Yeah, they are, yes, the, that's right. There's an affinity there. That's right. I don't know if they did any ice fishing, but they could <laughs> Uh, the, other, the other thing that's important at this point is the importance of the connection between the religious communities uh, and uh, the political entities and the connection with kings uh, uh, in, in the Anglo-Saxon period with a variety of kingdoms and the conflicts that arose between uh, we would put it in the language of church and state. Well, that's a, probably a little bit too grand for this period. Mm -hmm. But I want to suggest to you that one of the through lines in Anglican uh, uh, Christianity is that conflict with the state. And, and, and all you have to do is think about Henry II and Thomas Becket, the great martyr who's... Uh, um, was uh, at Canterbury. He was Archbishop of Canterbury and his, his cult was celebrated at Canterbury. Uh, and you can only, you can understand the nature of that conflict and how intense the conflict between the king or the rulership and the church could be when you think about the fact that it was Henry VIII who destroyed uh, uh, the, the shrine of Thomas Becket in Canterbury. Now, why did he do that? Because Thomas Becket was an archbishop that resisted his king. And so that conflict, uh, it, it runs through, uh, not only in, in England, on the continent as well. Uh, the rulers of Europe were always trying to exert control over the church uh, in, in, on the continent of Europe, particularly over the Pope. So the French at a certain time and the Holy Roman Emperor at a certain time, uh, you know, they had uh, some power over the Pope, even to determine who was the Pope. So when we get to Reformation in England and we see Henry VIII in conflict with the church, this is nothing new. This is part of a long tradition of conflicts between rulers and the church. And it was over uh, who got to appoint the bishops uh, uh, over who, uh, over the lands themselves, whether they could benefit from the church lands, which were vast. Uh, one of the big fights they had was over which courts uh, could try clerics who misbehaved. There were church courts, and perhaps not surprisingly, they tended to be easier on <laughs> misbehaving clerics. Uh, than uh, the, the, you know, the courts of, of the king. Does that sound familiar? I don't know. It, that, uh, you know that, could, that could actually have happened uh, in more recent times. But anyway, this was one of the great conflicts between uh, you know, the rulers and um, you know, the, the church itself. So when we get to Henry VIII, just to say that this is not new. This is something that's happened throughout the history of the church. And nor is it old. Uh, I served briefly at Trinity and Wall Street uh, down in lower Manhattan. And that is a tract of land given by the queen that, that was essentially all of lower Manhattan for a period of time. And so they pay a rent and the rent for that land to the queen is 12 peppercorns. <laughs> and so L Lambeth, one of our gatherings of, of bishops for the Anglican communion is a place where some churches are invited who have a stake in helping gather and Trinity is one of those churches. So every year the rector shows up almost kind of in a tongue in cheek way with a vial full of how it's a decade between, pen, uh, between Lambeth's. So however, 120 uh, peppercorns in a little tiny file that is then humorously given to the queen is still like our, <laughs> our rent is due. It's been 10 years, here you go. Enjoy a steak, a uh, poivre and here you are. Yeah. Yeah. I hope she does that too. It's like right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it still happens. I mean, that the church and the state, we acknowledge that that tension is still yeah. very much there because now Trinity has a huge endowment because of that 
privilege, and it was a privilege, it's not really a right or a blessing, but the queen gave them that land, and now it just happens to be the world's most expensive land. So, and uh, they have one of the um, uh, Episcopal Church's largest endowments as a result, exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, by the time of the uh, invasion of William the Conqueror, 1066, the Catholic form Christianity is well established and, and well and truly established after, after that. Uh, but I wanna come to the Reformation in England. And one of the things you always hear is that the English church would reform was because Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife. Um, and that is a gross overstatement for one thing, reforming movements were alive throughout Europe and in England well before Henry VIII got a roving eye, mm -hmm. or more importantly, before Catherine of Aragorn didn't produce a male heir. That was the particular problem. Um, for some centuries, there had been a recognition that there was a need for reform in the church. The Reformation didn't start with Martin Luther and his, you know, Theses on the on the door uh, nailed to the door of the, of the warp and warper. It started long before that with with movements for reform, both in England and elsewhere, that recognized that there were some serious problems uh, in uh, the Roman Catholic Church. In uh, um, a lot of this began with what we know or call the Renaissance when. Uh, there was a rediscovery of Greek and Latin classics that had been lesser known or totally unknown by people in Europe. Uh, this happened in Italy, but it spread throughout the, the whole of Europe and into England as well. And part of this was fueled by the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453, because it, as that was occurring, a lot of Greek scholars fled Constantinople and went uh, uh, west uh, toward, uh, toward Italy and England and all over Western Europe. And so you had this, this whole new Orthodox tradition and literature that the Western uh, intellectuals had not had, which began to uh, percolate uh, in the intellectual circles around Europe. Uh, and one of the most important figures in this, and one to me, one of the most attractive figures uh, in this whole period was a Dutch scholar named Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a priest um, and a scholar. He was the most renowned scholar of, of, his, of his time. Uh, and he was uh, a writer and a reformer. Although he remained Catholic, he never left the Catholic Church, but he was deeply committed to reform. Uh, his most important work was his production of a Greek New Testament. Uh, and for the first time in the West, you had many people, scholars, learning to read the New Testament in Greek and not just in uh, the Vulgate, which they, the Latin, which they had been reading for so many years. You also, in this time, in the mid 15th century, uh, had a lot of scholars learning Hebrew. So uh, they were learning to read the Bible in its original languages. And, and this was a catalyst for a lot of reforming work. Uh, Erasmus was also uh, um, a humorist in a way. Uh, he wrote a book called Julius Exclusus, uh, which uh, is um, an attack on the Renaissance Pope Julius II, who died leading his troops in the battle. And he has Julius come up to the door of heaven and find it closed. And he starts banging on the door and said, let me in. My key doesn't work, you know. He's supposed to have a key, but he can't get in. And Peter is behind the door and Julius is outside. And Peter says, what's that stench? Uh, and it, it goes on from there. It's pretty, uh, uh, um, uh, the Pope, the current Pope was not, was not all that pleased with that. But just for you to see that the reforming impulse didn't start with Luther, didn't start with Henry VIII. It was something that was going on throughout all of Europe. And in England, 
the intellectual community at, at Cambridge was very important for this. This is where some of the most important of the English reformers were educated, particularly uh, Archbishop uh, Thomas Cranmer. Uh, and we'll talk about him a little bit more later. Uh, what was problematic for Henry VIII was that he needed a son. And this was for a European king uh, to have that heir to take his throne was absolutely critical. Uh, and the role of the, of the consort of a European king was to produce an heir, which Catherine had not. And so Henry uh, decided either um, um, conveniently or out of conviction that God had not given him a son because Catherine had been married to his brother who had died. And this was some kind of a curse on him that she, she couldn't have a male heir. So he wanted to have the marriage annulled on the basis of this conviction that it was not proper for him to have married his brother's he wife. He missed that for the wedding? Huh? He missed that idea before the wedding? Right, there's this whole like, speak now or forever, hold your peace. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why <laughs> convenience or conviction. Yeah. Uh, but he... So he goes all over Europe trying to get scholars to get on his side. And uh, Luther actually told him, just commit bigamy, you know. <laughs> uh, and and uh, he, uh, some agreed with him, some didn't, but the Pope dithered. Now, why did the Pope dither? Because he was under the thumb of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was the aunt of Catherine of Aragon. Under normal circumstances, the Pope may have granted this, but because of the political pressure the Pope was under, he couldn't do it. So this ended up with Henry making his break with Rome and declaring himself the head of the church. Um, now, Henry had two important advisors, Thomas Cranmer, his archbishop, and Thomas Cromwell, his uh, chief advisor. They were both reformers. And for years, they are pushing Henry as far as they can push him toward reforming the church. But Henry is conservative. He will only be pushed so far. And people who push Henry end up losing their heads uh, and, and distressing uh, regularity. Uh, but in this time, um, what begins to happen in, in Britain is the formation of a specifically English or Anglican church. Uh, and one of the most important factors in this was something that was done by Cranmer. And that was the production of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, Cranmer is the genius, the artist, the wordsmith that gave us some of the most beautiful prayers, prayers that we pray in somewhat different forms to this very day. The book that you hold on uh, in the morning when you come to worship or when you use, do morning prayer, evening prayer, uh, even song, uh, many of those words uh, were either written or collected or shaped by Cranmer. And if there's anything that is that holds the Anglican tradition and the Episcopal Church together, it's the Book of Common Prayer. It's the way we pray. It's uh, the way we mourn. It's the way we celebrate. It's the way we learn. Uh, it forms us as a people in profound ways. And we owe that to Cranmer. Uh, and, and that book... Um, gave shape to the church that was emerging. Now, when Henry died, his young son, Edward VI, came to the throne. Poor Edward. Poor Edward, yeah. Uh, Talk about being not up to the job. Well, physically just, uh, um, physically weak. Uh, and when he died, what, 15 or 16? Mm -hmm. Very but young. It appears, uh, there's a wonderful English scholar named Dermot McCullough, 
if you want to do any reading on, on the Church of England or, or the Reformation, uh, McCullough has just done a splendid uh, biography of, of Cranmer um, and uh, among other things. It's a doorstop, let me warn you. Uh, but he did a, a book on the English Reformation, Edward VI, and it appears that Edward, in his earlier training, had actually been trained in a more reformed manner. Uh, but, so Edward and his advisors moved more enthusiastically toward a more Protestant Reformation, and in this case, uh, more toward uh, the, the more Calvinist form of things in Geneva. Uh, uh, and less uh, toward what Luther was doing. Um, and that Calvin and Geneva influence would continue uh, for, for, many, for many years. But as Jared has said, Edward died early. Uh, and that um, brought eventually after some machinations and another tragic figure in English history, Lady Jane Grey, the, 12 days queen that ended up losing her head because they put her forward as queen uh, before uh, Mary Tudor. Uh, Mary, fiercely Catholic, um, brought the old church back as much as she could. Protestants fled if they could. Others like Latimer, Ridley, and Cranmer uh, were burned at the stake. Um, but Unfortunately for Mary, and fortunately for a lot of Protestants, she also died within five years. Uh, and then her sister, Elizabeth, came to the throne, Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth was another fiercely intelligent, powerful, take no prisoners woman. She was her father's daughter, if there ever was one. And Elizabeth uh, was in some ways like Henry, traditional, and in other ways like Edward, more reformed. So the church that Elizabeth produced was not Catholic enough for the Roman Catholics and not Protestant enough for most of the Protestants. She walked this way between the old church and uh, the more radical reformers, both in England and on the continent, uh, and stuck to that way in spite of all efforts to pull her one way or the other. And that Elizabethan settlement, which has the church standing between the ancient tradition of Rome and the emerging tradition of uh, the Protestant um, um, a Protestant Europe is something that, again, marks the Episcopal Church to this day, the so-called via media. Um, but it also caused the Anglican Church a lot of trouble because you had the Catholics that were not happy with the separation from Rome, wanted to return to restore the old church. And that got pretty dicey when they appeared to be wanting to kill Elizabeth and, you know, restore uh, the church. And then uh, the group that began that would become Puritans who did not think the church was sufficiently reformed. And, and these were fights uh, over liturgy, over uh, what were called ceremonials. Uh, do you have candles on the altar? Do you have crosses? Uh, do you have cloths? Do you cross yourself? Do the clergy wear vestments? Do the clergy wear vestments? What kind of vestments do they wear? Um, and, and there were all kinds of controversy. There were controversies over bishops. Should you even have bishops? And how should the bishops be vested? Now, all of these things, now the, again, the, the issue of whether the clergy wear vestments or not may seem to be as silly as whether you, you know, trim your hair in a certain way. But it was all about, you know, who got to say, who had the power. And so these conflicts between uh, the more radically Protestant on one side and the more traditionally Catholic on the other side uh, produced what 
has been known within the tradition, the broad church in the middle, that um, were very comfortable with some of the ceremonials, less comfortable with others. And in fact, there were you know, efforts to limit the kind of ceremonial activities that a, that a priest could do. <clears throat> um, and uh, again, that I want to raise that issue because I think those issues of how reformed we are, how Catholic we are, and how we worship and what our worship looks like, uh, those are conflicts which are ongoing in the Episcopal Church and the broader Anglican Church, and they go all the way back to the beginning uh, of the, the Anglican tradition and, and its uh, reformed, um, you know, the, the reformed developments in the wake of Henry VIII and so forth. Um, those, those endure. Um, so, uh, a couple of other things. Um, we've talked about English, the Anglican history, we've only gotten up to Elizabeth. So, let me, let me. In 1600, that's good. That's, that's, you've really taken us on a long walk already. <laughs> yeah. um, the Anglican communion, you may or not, may or may not know this, is the second largest um, Christian body in the world, some 85 million people. And this is uh, a wonderful thing that was based upon a terrible reality, and that is the British Imperial Project. Because everywhere they went, they started churches. Uh, and they, along with the soldiers and the merchants and so forth, the priests came. And um, some was simply for the service of the soldiers and the merchants, and others began to reach out to the indigenous communities. But Anglicanism spread, particularly in the 19th century, through the imperial project, but also through conscious missionary efforts. Um, in the case of the church in the United States, it came as a part of the colonial project as well. So when people from Great Britain moved to the United States, uh, they brought with them their religious tradition, where it's, whether it was the Puritans in, up in New England or whether it was uh, Anglicans in Virginia and, and elsewhere or uh, the Anabaptists or wh whoever it was, those, you had different regions of the, of the American colonies that were characterized by one or, or two or three various traditions. Um, many of the early uh, patriots were part of the Anglican tradition, but also many of the early resistors uh, to uh, revolution were from the Anglican tradition as well. Um, did you know that the first bishop uh, in the United States, in the United States uh, is mocked and parodied in uh, Hamilton? Heed not the rabble who scream revolution. They have not your interests at heart. That's exactly right. Samuel Seabury. Yes. And he was uh, the first bishop. He had to go over to, to Scotland to be uh, ordained as bishop. Uh, but he was uh, against the, the revolution. Uh, but yeah, he's, uh, he's the one that Hamilton and his friends are lampooning, uh, lampooning and, and, and mumbling about just before the best scene in, in Hamilton when uh, King George comes out. By the way, if you haven't seen Hamilton or watched it on Disney, it's really spectacular. So, but anyway, I, I just, you know, a little, little thing for you to know that the first bishop of the United States was mocked in the, in the musical Hamilton. Um, and after the war, obviously, the Anglican Church in the United States had a problem. All of the prayers and so forth were on behalf of the king. And now, well, you're not gonna you're not gonna pray for the king. Maybe you are, but not in the same way that you did before. So there's uh, the first uh, revision of um, the well, the, the name was changed to the Protestant Episcopal Church, uh, and then the first revision of the prayer book uh, came in 1789, um, and. Uh, 
that began a process of, of revising prayer books uh, to great controversy and distress that has continued to this day. Um, and uh, uh, people are still mourning the 1928 <laughs> prayer book. Yes. I know about that. Um, and now we're talking about another one, um, which certainly will not um, come in my lifetime because they're just starting and you know these things take forever. I'm a latecomer to the Episcopal Church, and it baffled me as a young adult to be coming into a church where they kept referring to the new prayer book, which was made around the time that I was born. And I was sort of, how can this be new? It's, it's just three decades old. And they really, uh, there were churches in, in Dallas that advertised Episcopal Church. We used the 1950s. <laughs> and yep. This was probably in the late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. They were still fighting. It's my predecessor who had the distinction of removing the 28 prayer books from the pews, which sat oh, alongside gosh. the new ones here. So when I got to St. John's, <laughs> almost a decade after that had happened, there was a box of 28 prayer books <laughs> sitting in my office as though like, you do with this what you want to. Uh, many of them went uh, to people who wanted them for heirlooms. And then I have on the top shelf, inaccessible except by ladder, uh, a few that I've retained because they're lovely. The first yeah. prayer book I was ever given, yeah. I didn't know there was another prayer book, was the 28. And I thought, how do people use this on a given Sunday? Like, this is intolerable. I can't yeah. speak these words. <laughs> Come to find out I had the wrong prayer book. So, well, then, uh, and, and, uh, the, that illustrates the importance of the prayer book. Right. I mean, the fact that people are rooted in how they began to worship and pray. And, and you take that away, and it's painful. It, it also is very much a part of the Protestant impulse, as much as that's a Catholic document, placing the liturgy in the hands of people. Oh, yeah. And, and not just the hierarchy. Um, and, and then the, the, the result that it's so well owned that there's grieving when it's taken away. That ownership is part of our DNA, that the, that the peoples have, people have the liturgy. And, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. It can be problematic, but it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the language of liturgy needs to change, but it's one of the most conservative parts of Christian faith. Uh, in, in one sense, we are doing uh, liturgies uh, that were, you know, done in Spain in the fifth century. You know, there's, there's just th these things endure, uh, even though they get um, updated in, in terms of their language. Um, just a, a couple of more things. Uh, in the 18th and 19th century, there were two important movements, which also continues to shape us to this day. Uh, a revival renewal movement, often called the evangelical movement, um, characterized by people like the Wesleys and the Methodist movement, uh, a return to more personal individual piety, um, and intensely um, um, emotional in many cases, um, a kind of re Christianization of the Re original Reformation. Uh, Wesley's heart is strangely warmed when he's, uh, you know, hearing uh, uh, words from Luther's uh, commentary on Galatians or Romans, one or the other, I can't remember on hand. So anyway, you have this, the evangelical movement, the renewal movement, you have in, in the United States, you, uh, you have all kinds of renewal movements that are occurring. Uh, in the, in the early parts of the 18th century. And so that uh, personally pious, uh, conversionist, um, um, deeply biblical form of faith, that evangelical stream uh, firmly located within the Anglican tradition and part of the Episcopal tradition to this day. In the 19th century, uh, you had the so-called Oxford movement or the Anglo-Catholic movement, which was a move back toward a more traditional forms of worship while remaining Anglican or Episcopal. Um, 
Some of them, like Henry, John Henry Newman, left and went to Rome, but, but many stayed. And this was where you had, back to the old controversies about candles and crosses and crucifixes and clothing, what the, what the uh, liturgical garb of, of, of uh, the priests were. And so that Anglo-Catholic tradition that arose in England came to the United States and going back to what I was telling you about what's happening in, in Elizabeth, the more traditionally Catholic, the more traditionally Protestant, those uh, tensions that are hopefully creative tensions in the life of the church are part of our DNA to this day. Um, and in the 20th century, you know, we don't have time to talk about the rise of uh, of liberalism and biblical scholarship and the ecumenical movement and the liturgical movement, all of which are part of 20th century Anglican tradition. Uh, but I want you to see that the through line of these two traditions uh, that we hold together in creative tension right here at St. John's uh, are part of who we are. And I think rather than being destructive are enduringly creative. Mm -hmm. And if we try to get rid of either one of them, I think we've lost something that um, is uniquely Anglican and a precious possession that we have uh, that perhaps others don't have to the same extent. Uh, let me stop. I've gone on far too long to see if there are questions, observations, things you want to uh, remark on or wonder about things that I should have said and didn't or you too Jamie and Cameron I'm hoping you could maybe expand a little bit on um because obviously I, mean, I read uh that uh St. Paul's on the Hill was more of an Anglo-Catholic parish mm -hmm. when it existed mm -hmm. but it closed 10 15 10 years ago, ago. Eight, eight years ago yeah eight years ago um that was sort of representing more of an Anglo-Catholic tradition mm -hmm. in sort of this area yep um I guess sort of like if you think about the life of St. John's in a way, obviously he's trying to sort of do a bit of both. You know, there's, there's, there's still right one Eucharist, obviously. Yep. Um, there's still aspects of Anglican policy too, but also both. And you, how, would you, how, do you, how would you situate this parish and sort of the other parishes locally within this sort of tension? Do you want to take a stab at that, Jerry? No, want me to... I want you to take a stab at that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you'll get, each of you will get uh, one of the history books of St. John's as a Welcome to St. John's. Like yeah. at the, at the treasure Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Um, so a couple things. St. John's is in Minnesota, which is historically a very low church, or, or uh, to use a, a less like insider talk, is congregationalist would be like the theological word. Like that's the, much more driven by that, that impulse, um, in part because Minnesota itself is deeply grounded in Catholicism, right? Like there's a huge Catholic component to our, our history as a state. Right. And so Anglicans here differentiated themselves in part by being more, more Protestant, more Presbyterian, more Presbyterian <laughs> right. Um, and St. John's was firmly in that camp. When I got here, I joke about the 28 prayer book. One of the things that was the fondest for the 28 prayer book was that it located the principal service for Sundays would be morning prayer, which um, if you go back to Cramner, he gave us like a compendium of liturgical resources translated into English. And one of those compendiums is the office or what the monks would pray or cathedrals would pray, the prayer offices. And those were not Eucharistic, they're not sacramental. When, when the church came to the States, uh, partly because of a less priests available and vast distances, there became a sort of tradition here that leaned on that low church or daily office way of life. Whereas the Catholic life centered on the sacrament as the principal way we gathered um, in Minnesota, but also across the country until the liturgical renewal, that was more than norm, except in a few pockets. Um, and so Minnesota, and especially St. John's, had morning prayer for our principal gathering up until my predecessor, who was here for a full decade. Um, and when he arrived, uh, there had been a failed uh, rector search because the rector who was being called 
saw that St. John still prayed morning prayer instead of Eucharist on Sunday mornings, and it was well into the 90s, and they said, oh God, I don't know if I can handle doing that all over again. My last parish, when this was <laughs> in the 80s, when this happened, I had to navigate that, and it was terrible, and it was hard, and it was grief, yeah. and I can only do that once in my career. So they called someone they wanted, that person thought about it and said, you know what, never mind, I'm not coming to St. John's. So St. John's paused, and thought about it and said, okay, clearly we're going to struggle to be a church in the modern era without really embracing the new prayer book. Mm -hmm. And the new prayer book places Eucharist principally at the center of the life of the church. Yeah. Uh, and so my predecessor came and they had kind of arrived at a compromise. There would be morning prayer one Sunday a month. There would be a uh, right one Eucharist, which is that old 1928 Elizabethan English, one Sunday a month. Then there would be a right two Eucharist, and then by the time he was here, there was this whole liturgical renewal movement afoot with like very modern, expansive, and kind of the liberalizing of, litur of liturgy as well. And so there was like a family-oriented one with like New Zealand prayers and, and, and all these other things. Um, so my task when I got here was like this, we are the book of people of common prayer, was to just, all right, let's make it consistent. And so for the first five years I was here, we moved to seasonal liturgies where we would just do one of those things for like a whole season. Um, so that, to answer your question, this is a long walk. I would say that we are now firmly where Elizabeth intended for the church in the middle. Or sort of we, it's, but if you ask any of the long timers who've been here for more than two decades, they will say, yeah, it's been a little struggle to get used to this whole like Eucharistic life as the center of our life newcomers are like this is the episcopal church that i encountered it in virginia or or yeah. in you know new york more like i can the identifiers are similar um but there are parts of which as jay has really eloquently shown that the through line is often with us for longer than we ever imagined too so that that protestant dna will pop up in other ways on a regular basis at st john's and then we'll run off and do high uh, mass on all souls, which never used to happen. Um, and Compline used to have thuribles and incense before the pandemic started. So there was a little bit of that high church influence as well. <laughs> so that's and a long it, answer. Was that sort of like that some of the um, parishioners from St. Paul's on the Hill came here? That didn't hurt. I mean, there were some folks who did come. Uh, the other higher church place in the diocese is um, the cathedral. That, yeah. that has a tradition that has long been a little bit more high church. Um, so when St. Paul's closed, interestingly, the architecture of our building, which was built in 1902, yeah. follows the Oxford yeah. movement. It was like right at the end of the Oxford movement where everything was like the highest ideal in Christian architecture is Gothic. And so if you see churches built from about 1890 to about 1910, they're, I mean, even Presbyterians are like, they're very gothic and that's a that's an influence in part of the of the gothic renewal of the oxford movement so, so the cathedral very much gothic. And if you go to chicago go down and take a look at fourth presbyterian which is as gothic as any right. uh, episcopal church you'll ever see but a lot of that was also the i would call it religious romanticism mm -hmm. of, the late, of the late 19th century romanticism was a big thing in general but then you had a looking back to this earlier period and, and uh, um, a, a, a rebuilding of, of that, of those images of those earlier churches, particularly uh, particularly in Britain and in the Anglican tradition. But you have some of that in, in, the, uh, in the Catholic churches as well yeah. uh, that were built in that era. So if you go to Trinity, where I work, they have St. Paul's Chapel, which is right across from Ground Zero, and just very colonial stone chapel uh, was built on Broadway. It was sort of the Chapel of Ease that was the first one outside the wall. And it was built right as the country was being founded so that when the first uh, Congress met, they walked over to St. Paul's for worship afterwards. And there's like the George Washington pew there and all, all these strange uh, conflations of church and state that always make me uncomfortable. But St. Paul's Chapel, if you walk in, is stark walls, no stained glass, no artwork. The only thing that is vaguely Christian other than there's an altar is that over the altar is this like cloudburst, this very uh, Renaissance, very kind of enlightenment <laughs> and, a, and a triangle in the middle. And then the words in Hebrew that just says Yahweh. Um, and it's, it's very Puritan in a way, like because they're iconoclastic. 
but speaking of Catholic churches, that same architect did the chapel at Versailles. And if you walk into the chapel at Versailles, very Catholic space, still very Enlightenment era, very stripped down. So those influences are strange that were going on across right. back and forth in the continent. Yeah, well, you know, look at the, uh, uh, the churches in London that were built in the 18th century. Again, very clean lines, mm -hmm. compare, uh, you know, or even a little earlier, compare St. Paul's Cathedral to Westminster Abbey, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking very different kind of spaces yeah. and which spoke in the 17th century then when they're rebuilding St. Paul's after it burned down to uh, the uh, um, influence of a more Renaissance uh, uh, kind of regularity and structure and so forth that you see in the building. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think high church is kind of in the eye of the beholder. You know, somebody coming from a more so-called low church tradition would think, oh my gosh, this place is really Anglo-Catholic. And right. somebody from an Anglo-Catholic church would say, yeah, a little bit low. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's often con considered that it's about aesthetic. So I, I always, when we get into these discussions of basics over the years, it's the comfort zone of Episcopalians to talk about buildings and the liturgies and all of those things. But the theology that undergirds high church and the theology that undergoes girds low church are very different. And so, yes, they will have aesthetic like manifestations. Yeah, manifestations. But gosh, watch a watch the installation of uh, the presiding bishop Brown, Ed Browning uh, in the 1950s. And you will see like precision liturgy that looks crisp and clean, but the, the order of the day was low church then. So we tend to think low church, we think casual, you know, easygoing, right. but not necessarily. Like it's just about what does it mean that we're doing underneath it? And um, you can see some very like pristine liturgy that is low church, and you can see some very casual high church. Um, we have a house church that meets here in Minnesota that's small group, um, and it's it's St. St. Anselm's, I think, um, very high church. Some some people who left St. Paul's on the Hill years and years and years ago, and they don't have a building, they meet in homes, yeah. but incredibly high church, higher than St. Paul's on the Hill, right. Right. but right. casual and comfortable. Yeah. Well, isn't it too, they also can sort of manifest politically in really complex ways too, right? Mm -hmm. It's like some Anglo-Catholic parishes can be very liberal theologically. Yes. And, and in terms of sort of like, you know, various you know, gender sexuality, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it can really, which is sort of, so it's not necessarily not what you so. expect. Right. But so I think, oh, some traditional super high church means more sort of like a Catholic can be a little bit more in the show to house, but it's a little more complex than that. So, yeah. So. And, and I think uh, we had a, uh, we were with some friends who are Buddhist over the weekend and we were talking about the difference between, because one of them grew up Methodist and the Methodist church has been wrestling with human sexuality now for decades and, and what to do about it. Um, Presbyterians as well. And um, Episcopalians love to like, particularly progressive Episcopalians to tout their bona fides on, on that front. But UCC church was like out ahead of us years and years and years ahead of us on that. And I think one of the reasons why the Episcopal church has been able to stay with uh, some of those liberalizing movements that have been good for the full inclusion of all God's people is because of, of authority and where it sits. With Methodists and Presbyterians, it is sort of diffused out. So it's really hard to get, I mean, Look at our country and politics. Like, it's really hard to say, like, we're all going to be on this particular moral place, and folks can't get there without some some consolidated authority. And the Episcopal Church has a balance, but certainly enough hierarchical authority to say, like, nope, that I mean we're moving in this direction. Like, let's go, people, let's move along. Yeah. And sometimes it's been actually the house of deputies that helped get the bishops and priests there like it was the people but there was authority there as well it was really clearly defined authority whereas it's not always in every denomination so clearly you know, defined if, if the fiscal quality were the same as the methodist we'd be in the same place so we would be yeah. because they they require the vote of all the methodists right. in the world well the presbyterianism is even more decentralized yeah. right so it's even less hierarchical right oh, yeah. 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 Right. right. It's like every church is essentially autonomous. Basically. Yeah. So yeah, my wife uh, consults in a church organization. Her boss has this consulting organization, but also a church plant. And the entire charism of this Presbyterian church is, is LGBTQ inclusion. And so you like if you popped in for a Sunday and be like, what this is Presbyterian, 
like, wow, they're radical. Uh, down the street from me is the former pastor of Central Presbyterian, like very different experience of, of Presbyterianism. Um, <laughs> because it's decentralized. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, went through um, confirmation classes and the rector who he liked the phrase rector because it means ruler if you like that um, <laughs> he referred to the Episcopal Church as the GOP at prayer <laughs> and that was very consistent with what one saw and that was in the middle ages it and it was it, I mean across the country that, that that's another huge shift like socially in our, our country. I mean, Jay said, we're not going to get to the 20th century, but like <laughs> the Episcopal church has, has shifted and changed. And I mean, demographically, there won't be an Episcopal church in 40 years in any real sense of like numerically, there will be pockets of population and probably practice, but a lot of the money and influence that we once enjoyed, whether we were the GOP of prayer or the Democratic party of prayer, is just gone and will continue to go. And that's probably for the better. Like we will probably have to rely on other things other than rulers and, uh, you know, parties at prayer. It's just not a bad thing. Jay, thank you for this presentation. It was a lot of fun. It's a, it's a, a history that, that I really enjoy. And uh, I, I was talking about my mention, if you're, since we did such a short trip to the Episcopal Church, this is a kind of the standard history of the Episcopal Church by Robert Pritchard. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's this mine's an older edition. There's a, there he keeps updating it with uh, new controversies and <laughs> new figures. I, we probably have this in the library. I, I, if we don't, we can order it. If you want to peek down and let me know, we can. So I, just if you if you're interested, this is a uh, a pretty straightforward discussion of how the Episcopal Church got founded here and the traditions that came to bear. And, um, um, you know, a pretty straightforward read. So, and uh, again, as I said, if you want some more on uh, Reformation and Reformation England, uh, Dermot McCullough is, is really, really quite wonderful. And uh, hopefully, and uh, we will get into the weeds on worship, which is uh, normally where history goes, but I'm really grateful Jay stayed with like movements and theologies because we'll get into the prayer book, the American prayer book, what St. John's does, why we do it. Um, so we'll, some of the things we've just talked about, we'll go even further into the weeds and answer your questions. Don't hesitate. I want to say if there are any of you that haven't yet had a chance to sit down with me and or Cameron, but either one of us or Craig, uh, we always like to, to meet new folks as they're coming in. And I'm sure this was said last week, but we're hoping for a new member Sunday where we'll welcome everyone. We usually do a brunch, but this year we'll probably do some other thing um, because it's just strange to sort of put the food under your mask and keep going. So, um, But know that uh, the hospitality intent is there because we want you to feel welcome. And beyond those in this room and online, there are probably another uh, almost uh, 10 folks who are joining St. John's who are either... <clears throat> coming to a couple of the classes towards the end, or they've come previously, um, or you know, they're, they're coming from another church in town, so they, they may not be coming at all. But just know y'all are not alone in this process of inquiry and, and entering, uh, but we're glad that you're joining us in these, these courses. Uh, Cameron, any housekeeping things that I'm missing? Um, I don't think so, at least not off the top of my head. I think, uh, uh, that was wonderful, Jay. Thank you so much for for uh, providing that lecture for us and that discussion. Um, yeah, in terms of housekeeping, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm just trying to stay vertical. <laughs> there you go. Stay vertical. Get well. Um, thank you all, and, and have a great week. Go get some lunch. I know it's past that lunching hour. So. Thank you so much. So. Yeah, if you come back next Thank week, you. when the pandemic is over, we'll do lunch and you can just sit in on the lunches and then walk out. Um, yeah, cheers, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Bye, bye, Jamie. Bye, Cameron. Bye bye. All right. Death? Yeah. Okay.
I always love basic class. It's the place where you get to like to yeah. jump into conversation that everybody really wants to talk about. Not some esoteric theology, like what does this mean and why do we do it? Thank 
Well, have a great time and um.
All four TPP channels. Mike, you're
Thank you. 